right now on Five on Your Side at 10. She's the most decorated gymnast of all time. But who's her biggest cheerleader? A closer look at the former CBC star who got bows to say, I do. The main difference for today as we got into the 90s was the humidity. Our dew points in the mid 60s today, but even a little drier. What that means for us when we add it to the heat and how long we can hold on to this dry trend. Crime dominates the news in St. Louis. But a new report questioning whether violent crime is really on the rise. We press city leaders. But first, more trouble at St. Louis public schools. Weeks away from the first day of class, brand new calls for school board members to resign. Tonight, SLPS board member Emily Hubbard is calling for the board's president and vice president to step down. Good evening, I'm Brent Solomon. This follows days of tensions after the superintendent was placed on temporary leave. Friday, St. Louis Mayor Tashara Jones called for a state audit over how the district is spending its money. Mayor Jones says the district started the school year with a surplus of $17 million. Now there's a projected deficit of $35 million. The mayor is also calling into question top-level hires Superintendent Keisha Scarlett brought in from Washington State. One of those hires is the woman now tasked with overseeing the district, Millicent Borshade, who we confirmed received a vote of no confidence by a teachers union in Washington. They have a lot of, uh, they have a lot of confidence building to do. They have a lot of trust building to do. In every crisis, there is an opportunity uh, for growth and for, for renewal. And as a friend of mine likes to say, don't let any crisis go to waste. So I think they have a, uh, a challenge on their hands and uh, hopefully it will be a strengthening point for them. Tonight, Board President Tony Cousins and Vice President Matt Davis tell five on your side. Their focus is on preparing the district for the first day of school, which, by the way, is August 19th. Five on your side will stay on top of the issues with the St. Louis Public School District. Look for updates on air online at KSDK.com and on the five on your side app. Tonight, we're looking to learn more about a deadly shooting in North St. Louis. First responders called to North Bendeventer around 345 this afternoon. Afternoon, they found a man shot multiple times. He died at the hospital. No word on any suspects. Homicide detectives now investigating. Well, for months now, we've seemed to hear about more and more violent crime in St. Louis. And while these cases may appear to be on the rise, new statistics show otherwise. New tonight, Five on Your Side's Robert Townsend takes a closer look at the numbers, asking the question, is crime really down in St. Louis? They have become all too common. Deadly shootings, armed robberies, violent attacks, and more happening morning. This follows a quadruple shooting that killed a woman in the Tower East neighborhood. Noon. A hit and run leaves a person dead in South St. Louis. And night across the city of St. Louis. Shot and killed a gas station cook. It happened Monday afternoon in Dutchtown. I feel like crime is up. I would say crime is definitely going down. Webster University criminologist Dr. Allison Gorga says it's a trend reported by police chiefs nationwide. Violent crime overall actually in St. Louis has been on the decline since 1993. According to the report put together by the FBI, homicides, robberies, aggravated assaults all dropped in St. Louis in 2023 compared to the year before. Property crime peaked in 2003 and has been declining since then with a little bit of an uptick in recent years that is driven almost entirely by the rise in motor vehicle thefts. Chief Robert Tracy has faced the city's crime problem ever since he became St. Louis's top cop nearly two years ago. When you start to see some of those numbers come down, it's uh, good work from the police officers that are out getting the job done in the street. But while violent crimes are down, researchers say the crime rate in St. Louis is higher compared to other cities. According to the data, the chances of you becoming a homicide victim in St. Louis are greater than in New York, Chicago, or Kansas City. Of course, the ongoing big question we want answered is what exactly are the powers that be doing to help keep the city of St. Louis safe?
What do you say to critics who say this department is not doing enough to curb crime? Uh, we got to make sure that we're listening to the community, and I think that's the major thing. Help our people accountable. What do you say to your critics who say you and your administration aren't doing enough? to battle crimes. Well, I'd like to ask my critics, what do you think we should be doing differently? Mayor Jones says the city has an all hands on deck strategy that focuses on prevention, intervention, and enforcement when it comes to tackling crime. In 2022, the city launched a new office of violence prevention, but are those efforts working? We absolutely think that they're making a difference, um, especially the work that our Office of Violence Prevention is doing with local organizations. I'd like people to know that we are looking at this on a regional level because crime doesn't stop at our borders and neither should our solutions. Robert Townsend, five of your side. And you can read the Major Cities Chiefs Association Violent Crime Survey for yourself. Just go to KSDK.com and click on this story under the As Seen on TV section. Today, hundreds of backpacks for kids in Ferguson. This was all part of the 10th annual Ferguson Unity Weekend. Families came out to the Emerson YMCA where kids could get free backpacks and pencils and notebooks. Free resources were also available to help families get ready for the start of the school year. Well, as the world watches Simone Bowles etch her name even deeper into Olympics history, we're looking to her husband's St. Louis roots. Tonight, our Annie Crawl hearing from the former football coaches about one of the most iconic sports couples in the nation. Annie. Brent, Simone Biles has claimed three gold medals so far in Paris, including one today in the vault final. But with so much gold around her neck, it's about time we deep dive into the ring around her finger and the legendary CBC football player who put it there. Walking the field where 2013 CBC graduate Jonathan Owens used to play was nostalgic for his football and track coach Moses Regular. Jonathan was cool, calm and collected, very coachable. In high school, Owens won CBC Linebacker of the Year thanks to plays like this against Slew High in October of 2012. In the third quarter, the Junior Bills have the ball, but not for long. Owens comes out of the pile end zone bound with a 40 yard score. Fun fact, CBC won that game 51 to 7. He shot me a text uh, a couple years ago and we do a scoop and towel drill. And he's kind of like, hey coach, I, I still got it. So that was a pretty good, that was an awesome thing. Owens played college ball at Missouri Western State, then signed with the Arizona Cardinals in 2018. A year later, he signed with the Houston Texans. That's where he met Simone Biles in 2020. After dating for two years, the couple got engaged and married in 2023. The 29 year old safety signed with the Chicago Bears during the offseason. This week, he got time off from training camp to watch his wife win gold twice. Simone also getting gold Saturday in the vault final, taking her to double digits with 10 Olympic medals. The height, you know, me and my wife talk about it all the time, just, you know, 12, 13 feet in the air is just, and then able to stick a landing is amazing to me. Simone came to CBC last year for Jonathan's annual free youth football clinic here, teaching kids from eight to 15. Oh, I've got a picture of him throwing balls in the drills and he's up there with every kid high fiving them. Uh, tries to get to know every kid by name if he can. Uh, I mean, that's just a testament to the person that he is. Now cheering on Simone on her sidelines, the love of his life showing off her goat necklace as the greatest gymnast of all time. The Bears tell me Owens will be back at training camp tomorrow. Simone has only two events left in Paris, getting ready to stun the world once again on Monday for the balance beam and floor finals. <laughs> Today, VP Kamala Harris meets with potential running mates as former President Trump hints at a possible debate, the latest from the campaign trail. If you can jump high, why not dream high? It's really the best of the best out here, but I can really be good at it. The Metro East track star with his sight set on Olympic gold. While it was hot today, it still didn't feel quite as bad, but the core of that heat once again starts to build in. What that means for us early next week, the hottest temperature we're going to get and why it's just a little different than last week's heat wave.
A day after Vice President Kamala Harris earned enough votes to win the Democratic presidential nomination, she's now focusing on who she'll pick for her running mate. The vice president's team says she's narrowed it down to six possible candidates. Among them, Illinois Governor J.B. Pritzker. The other finalists are Pennsylvania Governor Josh Shapiro, Arizona Senator Mark Kelly, Transportation Secretary Pete Buttigieg, Kentucky Governor Andy Bashir, and Minnesota Governor Tim Waltz. Harris's decision could come as early as Monday. Well, former President Donald Trump announces a debate against his new Democratic challenger. On Truth Social, he proposed holding a debate on September 4th, as long as it's hosted by Fox News. Trump had previously agreed to a debate on September 10th against Joe Biden on ABC News. It is not clear if Harris will attend the Fox debate. And it's been closer to normal to start the day. And the next few days will continue to stay that way, drying out just a bit. And it's hot, but not quite as humid. What that means for us the next few days and how hot it gets to start the week. All right, folks, Team USA is decked out in medals tonight, 61 in total. That's 14 gold, 24 silver, and 23 bronze medals. Host nation France sits behind us in second place with 41 total. The top five round out with China, Great Britain, and Australia. Our area is not short on young athletes who dream big and go on to actually accomplish their goals. Our Corey Miller introduces us to a jumper from the Metro East whose Olympic dreams could one day be reality. His name is the first thing you see when you arrive in Edwardsville. And if you hear his name on the jumping runway, we got Allen up. well, right good there. luck to everybody else. Malik Allen is one of the most accomplished jumpers in Illinois high school history. He's a two-time state champ in the triple jump, will head to Champaign to jump in college, and carries the memory of his late parents with him. You know, I did it all for my parents and stuff like that, but you know, it's also good to just, you know, do it for yourself too see how far you can get, keep pushing yourself. Allen recently competed at the under 20 track and field championships in Eugene, Oregon, where he placed fifth in the triple jump against some of the best competition in the country. It prepared me, it humbled me. I mean, I jumped against the best jumpers, freshmen, top freshmen in college. It's really the best of the best out here, but I can really be good at it after getting the same. Like, I just feel like I can be up there with them and win it. And while he continues his journey, the Olympic goal is always present. I think about it a lot, and I most definitely see my day, uh, see myself getting there in the future, 2028. And sometimes Alan's Olympic dream is a literal Olympic dream. I don't know. I went to sleep, and I was just on the runway. Had like the USA stuff on, running down the runway. And then, you know, we had a hop, skip, and jump, so it was like a bound, bound, and then on like the last one, then I woke up. I'm like. Oh, shoot. <laughs> I was just like, man, I guess I got to get there to know what's going to happen. Corey Miller, five on your side. You got to see it before you see it. Allen actually took home another triple jump championship this past season. His performance helped his Edwardsville Tigers win the Illinois Class 3A state team title. Weather impact now. Here's Gary Frank. Yeah, good evening, Brent. Uh, just before 11 o'clock, you know, there was some times where we could really leave and it gets steamy outside. Not so much the case. We're going to be able to go outside finally in the first part of August, and it's not incredibly steamy and it's not 90 degrees out there. Our dew points in the mid 60s. And what does that mean for you? Well, last week they were in the 70s, mid to upper 70s. This is pretty typically muggy for August, so that allows us to fall to around 70 or in the upper 60s. As a result, we had a few showers north. They drifted those clouds fell apart because we had this drier air in place and there's not much of a breeze right now. Here's where we are right now. It's 84 and it's you know, it's not great outside, but it's it's been way worse. We got to 93. Our normal's 90. We continue to go just above that. The wind is calm overnight. Temps go once again 
and in the mid to upper 60s. That's where our dew point is. That's typically as far as our temperature will go down. It is mostly clear though with light wind as we continue to head tomorrow. Our dew points will stay in the mid 60s. That's pleasant. That is not bad. And look at Wednesday. It's even lower. That means it's more comfortable and it's a little better. But in the interim, we're going to see this high pressure start to surge. You know, we're on the edge of it. No deep red colors here, which is positive for us. So it's hot, but it's not as humid for tomorrow. We're headed for the mid 90s. Our heat index is 97 to 100. When this number gets over 105 consistently, that's where we see those heat advisories. When it's over about 110, that's the excessive heat warning. And also when we start off at 80 for our low. So we're not going to get there. That's why you won't see the heat headlines. In fact, by the middle of the week, look at the departure from average. It's 90. Look how we continue to see blue in August. That means it's cooler than normal. And so we'll start off with some warmer temperatures and temps in the mid 90s. And then as we head into Tuesday, we're close to 100, but it's not quite as humid. So it only feels like it's about 102, 103. And then we're in the mid 80s. We're below average and actually we're drying out quite a bit as well. So looks like we're going to continue to see pretty pleasant conditions here over the next few days. Yeah, let's see if we can keep it in the blue. Yes, we sir. like that. Blue for blue in August. Yep. Blue for what? You were going to say something. No, just blue for now. All right. Yeah. We'll take it. We've got Corey standing by with sports. Well, we have some Cardinals heroics at Wrigley and some all-time greats adding to their legacies in Paris. Lots to talk about in sports coming up after the break. Back here in St. Louis, all eyes were on Wrigley Field today where it looked like another crushing defeat for the Cardinals until it wasn't. Kyle Gibson hit some trouble early, but he settled down four runs in seven innings for Gibson on the hill. The Cubs helped out in the eighth. Cards down four to one. Chicago throws the ball around and misplays this pop up in short center field. All of a sudden we're tied at four. Then that man, Tommy Pham, is going to ride to the rescue again. He triples in the ninth. He would go on to score on a Lars Newfar sack fly. That gave the Cardinals a 5-4 lead. And guess what? There's a look at the sack fly from Newfar. That would be good enough for Ryan Helsley. 1-2-3 inning and a 5-4 victory for the Cardinals at Wrigley. The season is winding down. You know, um, uh, looking at the standings, it's looking like you're probably going to need about 86 wins to get in. So, uh, we're, and we have... We have a lot of teams that um, are really good and ahead of us, so we're going to have to win about 30 more games, you know, it's just to even stand a chance, so we, we need to catch some streaks. This Five on Your Side St. Louis City SC coverage is sponsored by Together Credit Union. It's on to Game 2 of the Le League's Cup for City SC tomorrow at City Park. They'll face FC Juarez with a chance to win their group ahead of the knockout stage, and Coach Hackworth knows that's a big deal. Winning the group always helps because then that gives you the, the continuation that you're in good form, that you've won, and now you're playing, in theory, you know, uh, an opponent that didn't do that well in the group play. We're trying to just keep the momentum that we've been building. That'll do for sports. All right, Corey, thank you much. Gary, it's hot, but not hot, yeah, hot, not hot. all that bad. I mean, when we had last, when it's so soupy and, you know, it feels like <laughs> Costa Rica outside, you yeah. know, that's the difference. None right? of that. We don't have that going on. In fact, that allows us to, you know, start off the morning in the 60s and 70s, and that's a big deal because 95, 97, you keep that in mind, that's two, three hours out of the day. When you're up and it's already 85 and it feels like 95 at 10 a.m., that's a big difference. We don't see any of that stuff coming up. In fact, we got some 80s by next Saturday. Although Costa Rica doesn't sound like the worst thing <laughs> in the world. Thank you, my friends. That's all of our time. Late night Olympics coverage is next.